everyone, and welcome back to Random Alien Brain Droppings. I came across Miriam Delicato last year while reading a message she shared about meditation, and a while later I realized that she was a contactee, and she had shared that she had a visitation with tall blonde beings in the desert of New Mexico, and they pointed her in the direction of the Hopi Indians, a cause that she's been affiliated with ever since. Miriam's message is important to share, and I think you'll agree after listening to the interview. I hope you enjoy it. Miriam, thank you so much for joining me for this wonderful conversation. I know it's going to be everything that I imagined. I like to keep this very, uh, not simple, but just not so structured. So let's just treat this as a, a conversation between two people who have a lot to share. How's that? So welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm I'm thrilled to be here to have the opportunity again to just meet more people that have similar experiences in this process of waking up of um, to what life is really all about, and it, it's just great to it's almost like reconnecting with people every day, reconnecting every day. So thank you. Wow, Marianne. So thank you, and and reconnecting. Wow, I have thought about that so many times. And with certain people, I almost felt like I've met them before. And so many times I've gone back to um, looking maybe on social networks where I seem to be meeting a lot of people lately um, doing this work. And as we're having a little instant message conversation, I'm getting this sense of familiarity. And so oftentimes I'll click on their pictures And a couple of times I've seen people that looked so familiar, but I know that I've never really met them. I've also read a lot in my journey to my own discovery about my um, being an experiencer. And we'll get into that, what that means for me and then what that means for you. But for me, I really have felt very strongly that I've chosen this path prior to my coming here. And because of that and the way that I feel about that, I almost feel that there are kindred um, spirits or energies that I might have met prior to me being here on this earth. Um, so I want to know about Miriam, the experiencer, talking about that, because obviously you are reading the things that you have posted, um, learning about your uh, bluestarprophecy.com, which I did go through, and I, I have some things that I would love to talk to you about that. And the fact that you've written a book about prophecy, the blue star. Um, why don't you tell me where this all started for you, if you can? Asking that question, really to define it, where did it all begin for me? It truly began before I even came into this body, because I have visions of what that commitment was to my life before I even came here. And then as a child, where that began for me was through the awakening of um, what we would call psychic abilities and intuitive abilities that I've had. And then as a teen, again, a really strong awareness of other worlds and other ways of thinking, always being disconnected in many ways to the society and the people that were around me because I couldn't understand their lack of compassion, their lack of uh, wanting to understand the relationship between a tree and the earth. And so this this kind of set me aside when I was younger. And then, of course, it began the experiencer slash abductee, you know, contactee, any of the names that you choose will will really fit into my story. Because as a young, you know, 22 year old was when it really began. That was when the work, the life began. It took me what, 14 years to even begin to be able to comprehend, I think, the changes that were going to happen in my life. And it took me a long time to integrate what happened and to be able to be calm and, you know, presentable in a way that people would be able to connect and relate to. And in fact, if you go back and you watch a lot of the interviews that I've done when I 
first came forward, I am an emotional wreck. And I know people have recognized that I'm not that emotional wreck anymore. And that's because in society, we tend to, first of all, first and foremost, in society and the world, we tend to judge um, as a whole, um, you know, kind of blanketing. And so there was a lot of difficulty in being able to say, I am an experiencer. I've seen extraterrestrials. I've touched them. I've been in their presence. This is who and what I am. Now I say I'm proud to be this individual who was gifted this. I'm, I'm proud. I'm honored. I'm humbled by it. And so the, the beginning of this story is really, uh, about how is it that we can sort of move together through this synchronistic state that humanity, that each individual is moving through and the beginning, where did it begin, is probably the question that we are all trying to answer. Mm, very true. That's that's the question we are all trying to answer. Where did it begin, and what was that? What's really interesting is I I see so many parallels with many experiencers. Everything that you said, and it's uh, it seems to me that a lot of these things have started with an awakening that you might not fit in with normal society. You're paradigm is totally different you uh think you're i'm gonna guess that maybe you might have been a loner because of that in so many ways and that the things that you thought about the world were so different than your your peers and the psychic things precognition maybe really crazy dreams seeing things that you thought were real that you realize you're probably the only one that's seeing them and then as you have gotten older you start to understand a little bit more and, and maybe in your teens start thinking, you know, I don't know if you're artistic at all, but I used to draw a lot of pictures. <laughs> that would mean no. <laughs> no, I'm not artistic. And Miriam's shaking her head no. <laughs> but in your mind, I'm sure you painted pictures. Yes. Okay. Yes. So therefore you're creating, you know, scenes that didn't fit anything that you'd ever maybe seen before. I'm I'm getting a feeling that you possibly might have had an experience as a child, uh, maybe even within your family, that seemed a little strange or odd to you, and that might have set a precedent for you to think other things were possible, probably, expanding the possibilities of the reality that was. So did you ever have any experiences as, as a child with any sort of... Um, beings or um, any any craft or anything that made you really wonder? That's the, that's an interesting part of my story is that I absolutely did. My book, by the way, is uh, out there for free. I have it on my website to download. So please go to bluestarprophecy.com and download a copy. And in that, if you're reading the story, it clearly shows that the, the contact really started at birth. And through that, I didn't have any conscious recollection of it uh, until I had my prime uh, contact in 1988 at 22. And then I remembered. And what's interesting is that there are people um, who verified up to 40 years later, they verified those incidents of seeing craft the incidents of my, you know, the beings coming to me as a baby, my father, um, you know, verified that for me. And it's clearly stated in the book of how that happened. So it, it really did shape me unconsciously for the longest time. And of course, I think the question is, Am I artistic? No. I mean, I'm a stick, you know, give me a piece of paper and a pen, I make a stick person. But being creative, one has to think, what is that? What is creativity? And I often see people in today's um, arts that I know are bringing back visions of the other worlds. And sometimes they don't even realize that's what they're doing. It's quite fascinating. So, in that way, very creative um, of being able to paint those pictures within my within my mind and so forth. 
but that we must be very careful when we state this because creativity, when, when it's being said to someone who wants to debate the issue, would say that these things are being created in our minds and that we made them up. Well, you can't make up someone, you know, with the stories that I've laid out in my book, you can't make those things up. Uh uh-uh. uh, it does not happen, especially when you have people that come that have no attachment. They have no money attachment. There's nothing there for them to say, yes, this is what happened. So it's very interesting how all of this has been um, unfolding over the years and how this understanding of life in the synchronistic world that we're living in, which is happening more for everyone all the time. It's fantastic. And I, I kind of chuckle and I'm going to say, I always do. <laughs> I'm like, uh huh. Yeah. And then I've got these friends that, that haven't lived in this paradigm their whole lives. And they come to me and they say, Oh, wow. Did you notice that lately it's all been synchronistic? And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, been noticing. Or how about, you know, did you notice that when I th- when I think about someone, they call and I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> in there for a long right. time. <laughs> but, you know, we talk about these things and, and, and I think the more that we talk about synchronicity, then people will start paying attention. That's exactly it. And here's something that that I've said from the very beginning. Imagine. Stop and imagine a world where everyone is able to speak freely. The freedom to simply share and speak. What does this mean? Imagine a world where when I have a vision about a water disaster that I can speak freely to my, the people that surround me or to, you know, different, to anyone. And as we do, we realize that everyone in a specific area has the same vision. And so we take precautions to protect ourselves and to help the earth and to pray and to meditate. Imagine this world. Mm. And when I first And I said, when we begin to do that in our societies around the world is when the shifting of the planet will begin to take place, because that is a very, very um, core issue that humanity is learning that, that this is what we are here to experience is the physical, the senses, all to have all of our senses, but also to be able to have this sharing that we can have. And by doing so, we essentially are able to shift um, different energies on the planet itself. And we as a society, as a global society, because of the work of very, I don't know how else to word this, small individuals, meaning we don't have massive world stages. We don't have political world stages um, to speak to the entire world. So we choose to speak to the people that surround us. And if that's been, you know, that's through podcasts um, like we're doing today, we essentially say, let's share. And we have done that so much on a small scale that it's turning now from the micro to the macro. And this is literally a very small in comparison to the billions that are on the planet. And I've said this in the past, billions of people, how many, six, seven billion, is that right? Seven billion people on the planet. How many of those seven billion people have chosen to step forward into a more public role to speak about issues that are not uh, welcomed by, you know, 7.99% <laughs> of the billion. And what have we managed to accomplish is the shifting of the entire consciousness of a planet. 
And if we were to take all of those individuals who have done very key work all over the entire planet like that, we would be able to gather in one place and be able to say, okay, these are the people. This is, this is us. We are the unity that has changed and shifted consciousness to have greater understanding and acceptance. And that is what this uh, contact is about. That is what it is for me. Right. And so you have been one of that small percentage that very few of us there are out there right now who have lived um, this journey to this point to where you are right now and progressed in your understanding of this concept to the point to where you realized that you do have a voice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes a long time. It took me, oh my goodness, over 25 years to get to this point to where I have a microphone in front of my face. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with, and I can say this probably speaking for those millions of people, is that fear, the underlying fear of um, speaking your truth and, you know, just the way that things are in the world. You know, there's so much fear of judgment and fear of just the stupidest things. Um, what are people going to think of me? You know, I'm a mother. I have two children. What about my job? What about my family? What about my friends? And for me, it got to the point to where I just didn't care anymore because I realized nothing was going to change. And the way that we keep going, and if you sit there having all this information, keeping it to yourself, then you're not um, being truthful and honest with who you are. And so you're living a lie by not spreading the truth and, and spreading the message about um, this conscious um, awareness that we have. And, you know, collectively, I have felt very compelled to, to uh, basically what you just said, and, and that is that we can only do this together. And having platforms that we do now doing these podcasts and it is such a finite space to spread the message and do the work but we've got to start somewhere and if we just start here and more and more people start listening to these things and and realizing that we don't have anything to be afraid of by speaking these truths um, people say to me all the time aren't you afraid that you know, when you talk about these things, somebody's going to come knocking on your door, you know, and trying to shut you up or harm your family or, or what have you, you know, because we don't really know exactly. I have a, a big feeling that um, there's a lot, obviously a lot of uh, lies um, and a lot of truth that, that's being kept from us. And we are aware of these things and we do speak about these lies that are um, happening through our, our governments and what have you. Uh, keeping the truth from the people of what's really happening uh, globally, uh, you know, with what we're doing to the earth, um, how we're polluting the earth and how um, we do have the power to have free energy, just all of that, you know. They don't want people to understand that um, they are lying. <laughs> and, yes. and so that is a fear that I'm sure um, you might have had a little hesitation to maybe – uh, word things in a specific way, not to draw attention to yourself. But there comes a point to where you just can't look away anymore. And we're getting to that point where yeah, we here. need, we're right. We're getting to the point to where it's going to be. We, we can't, there's a point of no return, mm -hmm. you know, but, but I don't think we're quite yet, there yet. I, and I think that's just why I feel such a sense of urgency right now to uh, do what we can to change the way we think about um, our, our planet. And, you know, I'm, I really feel that you have a message that you have been trying to share in so many words. I'm sure it's, it's very difficult to um, explain it maybe and express it to way, the way that people could really understand. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the, the Hopi um, and that's something that I would like to talk about, um, because I know you feel very, um, compelled to, um, spread their message. 
And I wonder if you could maybe share with, with us a little bit about how you got involved with the Hopis. Well, I just want to back this up for a minute before sure. I get into that, just to say the the efforts that we, people like you and I, are making is not about imposing a thought or a way of thinking or even an absolute of anything. Mm -hmm. What we, I, you know, I, I'm speaking for you, <laughs> but Go right um, ahead. But I, I really know that what we are are tr are advocating is free thought mm -hmm. and the ability to for free to free speech, um, free spirit, um, to have the freedom of who we really are. And this is the, this is what we all advocate for, whether you're in a group that talks about being abducted by aliens, quote unquote, taken against your will, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about being a contactee who opens your arms and says, wow, they are up in the sky above me, whether you're an experiencer, whether you, you know, all of these different things, whether you're talking about, um, free energy, political systems, financial systems, all these things, what we're really asking for is the freedom to, to say, think, um, and, and, you know, on those issues and to question whether or not we believe that the system that we have in place is necessarily the right system for our planet, first and foremost, for the earth itself. And being a symbiotic relationship with the earth, we have to say that we are the other aspect of the earth. Okay. We are part of it. And so when when I say the earth, I mean the earth and everything on it. Mm. So that is really ultimately what I try to to share with people um, in my daily life and in, in, in these interviews that, that are taking place. And also to recognize that I really ask every single listener to not follow any one person or group or organization or thought, but to think on their own. And this is, is very clearly what we must do. We can't say, yeah, that's the way to go. That's, that's the ultimate way. We have to always say, that's a great way. Okay, let's try that. But always keep open to whatever may be around us. So that's extremely important. And in saying that, you know, this relationship that I have with Hopi is something that I consider to be deeply um, sacred. And I don't know that there are, uh, we need to have a greater understanding of what is sacred. I will not allow anyone in my life, in my world, to even crack jokes about the Hopi to me. Nothing. If it is a, if it is, well, they crack jokes because the, the Hopi joke all the time. They're actually kind of <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> okay. Right. But what I mean is, um, those, so those sarcastic jokes that are not really jokes at all and things like that. I consider even to be talking about them right now to be moving into a space that is highly sacred and how, where, what, when, why, all of those things, um, you know, I, I started that journey in 2003 when I was led through their land um, by these beings who had directed me many years prior to go there. Uh, and then after that, the following year is when it really, really began because I, I went and spoke to an elder that was on one of the mesas and it just snowballed from there. It just kept going and going and going. And, and, I have known, you know, and I know many, many, many Hopis at this point from all of the different villages and the different mesas and, you know, so forth. And my relationship with them is, is in part due to the relationship with the star beings, the, I call them the great ancestors. And I really want to try and get that name out there great ancestors because these specific group there's very 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 tall blonde-haired blue-eyed beings um you know 
uh, I've had people accuse me of saying that they're the Anunnaki that came down and they were the fallen angels. That's great. If you want to have that belief and live in fear, go ahead. Cause you've been, you know, it's a brainwashing tactic. Um, you have to, we have to be very careful not to box things and that's thinking freely. This is what I'm, what I'm talking about advocating think for yourself. These beings instructed me that there were very specific people and groups on the planet that had um, very specific jobs that they were doing, let's say. It doesn't make Hopi, quote unquote, special, so special that, you know, we should put them up on a pedestal. No, but to honor and respect the work, the spiritual, what I would call spiritual work, the traditional work that they do of holding ceremonies absolutely and they deserve our honor and respect and our um gratitude all traditional people so my relationship with hopi is what it is um it's you know i've worked with a number of different people out there for many years i've been very quiet about this work i'm still very quiet about the work what i can and will say is that when they've had major issues, uh, such as a few years ago, they had a um, governmental proposed constitution that they were bringing into the tribe. And the traditional people were, were adamantly opposed to it because in the language, it would have stripped them from their right, from their actual right to carry on their way of life. And the political and the non-political were so at each other. I mean, I was out there for five months. I lived in a room where, you know, there was no running water. There was no bathroom. It was freezing cold. Uh, I lived off of a little tiny coal stove and a hot plate for five months. <laughs> I've done some work with them. Now, I... Uh, that was that was a huge effort by many people in Hopi, and some of them, I mean, they just really did what needed to be done to to stop that. But a unified effort from all from all sides. And at that point, uh, I was sharing with the people in the world what was going on there. And days before, weeks before, we started asking. They started asking for prayer. So I started putting it out there, asking people to to pray for this not to go through. And so even days before, we were receiving messages that said pockets of people all over the earth were gathering together. I get chills because um, they were gathering together to pray um, for Hopi and with Hopi. And um, this was all being reported back to the people there. And they were just like, wow, you know, this was incredible. And then one particular Hopi told me later, shared with me that they believed that the reason that it didn't go through was because of all the prayer from all over the world. Wow. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is this important? What relevance does this have on my life? And the relevance is, is that the Hopi are still free. Not entirely anymore, because there's even there's a lot of things that are being tried people that the outside is trying to place on top of them. But why are they important? Because they stand for freedom. And and not only that, that these are my words, not theirs. Okay, um, they stand for freedom. They stand for um, balance. They stand for sacred, um, for universal knowledge, for understanding, for compassion, for masculine and feminine to be in balance. They, they stand for commitment. And one of the things that I'd like to say is that um, I wanted to bring someone out to Hopi at one point um, to meet some of the people there that I, that I associate with and work with. And I said to them, and I'll share, share with your listeners what I said. I said, when they come, please forgive us and be gentle with us because we are not like you. We have not been raised in a society with understanding. We have not been trained to have the same commitment that you have. And please do not judge us 
because we are asking and coming to you with our hearts open. And we are not as disciplined as you are as Hopi. That says who the Hopi are. Very humbling. Very, I, I, I have so much honor and respect for all, all Hopi, um, regardless of their position, regardless of their mesa, their village, their clan, their kiva, their any, I mean, it doesn't, it, it's all there to be honored and respected. And I have traveled, I've done enough traveling now, I've met enough people who are quote unquote traditional to recognize with my interaction with Hopi that they are very, very unique in this is my observation, personal observation, that they are unique within um, that society of even traditional people. And in in the different cultures that I have, you know, and I, I am not as uh, versed in indigenous cultures as people might think, um, or even ancient cultures, but everything I have been exposed to so far, um, I would still clearly say that the Hopi have, have a very unique aspect to who they are and what they hold. And if we can learn from them, you know, and I'll get, I'll say this and then I'll, I'll come bring it back to my experience with the star beings. So I'm kind of going off on a bit of a storytelling here. One of the things with Hopi that is really remarkable, and and it's it's difficult because people assume that what what they know should be shared. Well, sure, okay. What will it mean to you if if you don't understand the whole thing? Okay. But the way that that Hopi lives, for example, and this is again, is my observation. If you have, if, if you are in a family, you you have a husband and a wife, and then you have children. Those children are bo- a boy and a girl. Okay, so you have all of these different people in the family unit, and within the family unit, there becomes a conflict. One of the children is being having a problem with something. Okay, whatever that problem is, what do you do? Well, what's remarkable is the Hopi way of life, which is what we're talking about. The Hopi way of life will tell you how to deal with that. It will tell you, is it the, it, is it the boy or the girl and what the problem is? And then it will tell you, you go to this, this clan or this uncle or this auntie, and then they do this and they go and talk to this person. There's a whole structure to come back in and deal with that issue. Mm-hmm. There's a whole way of doing it. Um, and so there's different paths that they have. If you have a conflict with, um, if, if you have an issue that you want to bring to the chief, there's a whole process that you need to go to the, the, the Kikmangui, as they call him. There's a whole process that you need to go in order to get to him. Um, if you, if you want to get married, there's a whole process you go through. If you, it doesn't matter what it is. There is a process that you go through for every single thing that's imaginable, including how to deal with conflict what you do with that conflict, what kind of conflict is it? Where did it come from? Where did it stem from? How it's being viewed? And so everything, and and that always also includes a more, quote, spiritual understanding of how that's dealt with, which you have to get to that spiritual understanding. So these things that people often say, tell me, I want to know, just to explain the process of one issue and how it's handled in Hopi can take you years to understand. And that's what they still have. Because you'll have to understand the the process of who the who the people involved are and what their roles are and why they've been chosen. Then you'd have to understand what their limits are and why they're there. 
um, how it works both in the physical world and then it reaches into the spiritual world and why that process is there. There's a whole uh, learning that needs to take place. It's not just, yeah, you have, a, uh, you have this issue, this is what you do. So how does this relate to, for example, the star, the, the, the great ancestors, as I call them, the star beings, the extraterrestrials, the aliens, the ETs, whatever you choose to call them. How does that relate? Well, there is a balance that exists within the, the life of human beings. And although we don't all have to go and live the Hopi way, there are aspects to the life itself that we can benefit from. And so it is a remarkable people to honor and respect and pro- help to protect, to give support to protect, because when they still, to this very day, have this extremely uh, complex society, <laughs> extremely complex society, and then we look at the world and they say that they hold the world and the universe in balance, I, for one, have seen how when something happens in Hopi, it happens in the rest of the world. And I know that we, with the star beings and all of the people that are here, people like you and I, many of the people, I would say almost all of the people that listen to your program, every single one of the listeners is part of this. And we are all interconnected into what we would call the one heart of the humanity the people, the human beings that are here to protect the earth. So we are related to Hopi. We are related to other traditional people. We are related to the ancient cultures because these things had balance. This is why we tend to find ourselves after after a certain point. We will find ourselves in those communities and connecting with those people and ideologies and thoughts and process for that reason. The star beings, quote, great ancestors, told me that these ancient cultures and ancient traditions were, in fact, one, not entirely, but one of the key elements that we would need to be able to have a balanced future and that we, as a um, myself, as a contactee, had to support and help to protect what it was that is sacred. And for me, the Hopi are sacred. Traditional people are sacred. The land, the water, the earth, the air, the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, human beings, the plants, the animals, the rivers, the streams. Life is sacred. And we begin to understand the sacredness we begin to understand sacredness when we can relate. So the relationship is Hopi is sacred. How, why, what, where, when we determine through an understanding of the sacredness of a single grain of sand. And eventually we build into a very small mountain. Awesome. Um, just blown away by all of that as I'm sitting here listening to you tell the story. It's just so, it's so powerful. And I wish that we could grasp the enormity of what you're saying by just these words. You know, I know that it's, like you said, it would be, um, it would take years to explain the complexity of, you know, the way that they live and how they view what we take for granted, you know, so much. And um, you alluded to the fact um, in the very beginning that these beings had brought you to the Hopi. And I was really curious because I was really wondering about the connection that these tall, blonde beings had the Hopi. They're the same um, beings that they talk about in in their um, say folklore within the Hopi. But these tall blondes are the the beings that they've been connected with um, throughout time. Is that correct? 
I, I'm asked this a great deal, um, both privately and publicly. And uh, what I would answer to that both in both is that the, the deeper beliefs of Hopi, um, we need to also view as the most sacred. Okay. And when we talk, when I talk about this, and when I share my own personal experiences, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at it through the perspective of a single being myself, and then looking at it from the perspective of these uh, great ancestors. And the relationship with Hopi and their relationship would only, it would only benefit us to hear this directly from Hopi. Right. Do they have a relationship? I can't, I can't say yes, and I can't say no. That's fine. Uh, what I would say is that I would like this to be on the mm-hmm. record because mm-hmm. um, it, it, it is clear that we can assume that ancient cultures and religions know of these beings. It is an assumption that we are making due to uh, the physical evidence of rock paintings all over the entire planet, not just with Hopi, but all over the earth. Um, we have an assumption that these beings have had contact with the ancient cultures because of some of the language in some of the ancient cultural um, writings that we, that have been found all over the earth. Mm-hmm. And so we have to um, ask ourselves this, these questions, and, and, and this is what is most important. We must ask ourselves questions, and the question is, if these beings have had contact, ongoing contact, because, listen, many people from traditional societies around the world have publicly started to come out and say, yes, we know of these star beings. All sorts of traditional people are starting to do that. I'm not going to say Hopi has directly, Mm -hmm. but many others have. So we have to ask ourselves a question. If the ancient cultures and traditions of our world that are still, what, protecting the earth, traditional people all over the earth are still protecting the earth, fighting literally to protect the waters and the, the elements, then... Do we need to fear these beings? That's a question that must, I would ask anyone to answer, first of all. And that's because there's propaganda out there to say different. Second question, are these beings all in modern times? And the question is really, I can answer that one right out and say no, because of the ancient uh the ancient writings on the rocks and so on and so forth the history the ancient history and so again the propaganda is oh these people that are being abducted it's all the you know it's all the the dark forces at work and so forth and i'm like hey look how 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 arrogant i mean a person that makes that statement to me has to have the the level of arrogance and sheer um lack of ability to have free thought than anyone else that exists, in my view. I mean, anyone else. You say that to me, and I will immediately assume that you have no free will, that you are completely manipulated, and that you are absolutely under the control of the very people that you say that you despise. You are the ultimate person who is completely manipulated, propagandized, everything. And so, that's a very good question to ask about these ancient cultures. Are they connected? Because the teachings, the very um, sacred honoring teachings of these beings is the foundation, the fun, the, the very foundation and, and um, uh, core of what has been taught to me is honor life, meaning myself and all other human beings honor the earth and all life upon it except that you are a divine spiritual being do not use your abilities in any form that you are able to access to manipulate 
others around you. Uh, use your talents and your gifts from the other worlds once accessed to share to, and be in service to the sacred life that surrounds you. To continue to grow as a single spiritual being, not as a human being, because that, you know, reaching out beyond even the human being. And also to be gentle with yourself when you make a mistake and to recognize that it is part of an experience. It is not your lesson. It is not your karma. You're not being punished for something in your past. You are simply experiencing something. And again, the word karma has been propagandized into, well, if you're a woman and you were raped, if you were a woman and you were raped, then you did something in your life. You know, come on, it's okay. You know, no, that's not right. And we should not view it that way. Maybe it wasn't that woman took on that rape to teach someone something else. Maybe that was being in service. Maybe it's because the other humans that are around that watch the rape and torture and, you know, slavery of other human beings. Maybe it's, maybe we are sacrificing for them. The people in, 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 you know, in Africa, the women who were asked to go out uh, and, and get the water because the men would be killed and the women will be raped. You know, maybe that is for us to stand up as human beings and say, we have a responsibility for this. Maybe they are sacrificing and being in service. Maybe they came here to be in service to us so that we can learn something. Maybe they know much more than we do. And this is where the relationship between these great ancestors, the star beings, the indigenous cultures, the structures that they have around us and the people and who we are and what we're doing all begin to come together. And right now on the very planet today, it is an exceptional time and space for us to have a uh, very heightened awareness of these different uh, worlds that we can tap into, into each other, into the connectedness. It's a very special time. And so we are at this point where December 21st, 2012 was not the day. It wasn't a day. It wasn't the day. And listening to many of the people who sold their books and sold their conferences and went out and made millions, some of them, not all, but some of them, and they go out and they sell their books on 2012 and what's going to happen. We're all going to turn into light beings and lift off. And oh, here we go. Wow. You know, could we come back to some understanding of what was actually being said in that time? They didn't even have a beginning. Listen, I've listened to Mayans who didn't even understand what the what that was about. So just because we are sitting in front of a Mayan elder does not mean that that Mayan elder really knows what they're talking about. With no disrespect to them. Just because we're sitting in front of a Hopi quote elder doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about. Use free thought. Free thought allows that your being is the one to see the truth around you. And we must begin to have discernment about these things because that's the crux of this time. That is the crux. You're going to be thrown everything. Every every manipulation, every lie, every truth, every uh, understanding, every concept, you're going to have it all thrown at you. It's up to the individual to go inside themselves and determine what the truth is for them and to accept that and then continue to learn and grow. Hey, I am not perfect, for example, but, you know, I, I will look at something and I'll say, wow, this is what I think about this over here. And then I realize, wow, I couldn't have been more wrong. And we all are. Buddha was wrong. Jesus was wrong. Krishna was wrong. Um, all of the, the great spiritual leaders have been wrong. All of the great leaders of earth have been wrong. There is, this is being human. We must be gentle with ourselves. 
and recognize this interconnectedness between all life in all directions? Where do you begin to even comprehend what that is? Because the ultimate question that some people scream at me for, and literally I've been screamed at, the hope you need to tell us. How does one teach the secret of life itself? It's not a secret. That's the first lesson. It's within you. That's all that there is. I sit there and I listen to you speaking about the Hopi and how it's so difficult to explain, even even if there was like the message, okay? I think about people asking questions about the light beings as well. I almost feel like they ask us those questions about these energies and these beings. Well, what do they want? What's the message? You know, and I do hear that oftentimes, and I'm sure you do as well. And I've had people ask me in interviews. I had, what do you think it's for? And I have struggle with that so many times because I, I, as much as I've been ex- experiencing things throughout my life, I've come to realize that I don't even think we would even understand or be able to comprehend the message once it was given to us. Do you know what I'm saying? That's exactly it. That's why I can relate to what you're saying. And how can we understand the message if we don't even know what how, what questions to ask? Do you know what I'm saying? So then it goes even further in in that little quandary. So I, I've thought about that and I've struggled with it because I almost feel like, um, well, maybe that's not what's important. Mm-hmm. Maybe we shouldn't focus so much on that singular thought. Wanting, it's almost like instant gratification. People need to have a reason for X, Y, and Z. You know, if Hopi has a message, well, then what is it? You know, how is it, how would that, how could it even change your, your thought process if you can't even comprehend just maybe a grain of sand of what the whole message means? Because it's all subject to interpretation as well. You know, well, well, what they would have to say would mean something different to every person because we're all in a totally different stage of our evolution of our own consciousness. Mm-hmm. So that's why I feel it's very important for us to wake up and start thinking outside of the box, start listening to the things that you're saying. You know, we do have freedom of speech and, and we should be able to have freedom of thought um, to be able to um, expand our, our own evolution consciously because it's going to, I think, come to that point to where these things are going to be upon us and there is going to be a presence here. Okay, we're recording again. So I, I think that for us to be able to grasp the enormity of, con- I'm going to say, quote-unquote, contact because I think it means different things for different people. Um, that we just really need to think a little bit deeper about the way we're living our lives and, and just as everything has a resonance and we need to resonate our true being that we were meant to have on this earth. And we're so far away from that. I think so many times that it's hard for us to even grasp whatever the Hopi message would even be is what I'm trying to say. Right. And, and one of the things that I'm hearing, um, in your response is the word perspective. What is the perspective? And in Hopi, that is one of the issues that they've had to face is that, for example, people come to Hopi, they hear a little bit, and then they take their own personal perspective and they go out and they start talking about it and teaching it. And, you know, I will say that there's a few individuals out there who are talking about Hopi that really are being, you know, they're just not welcomed even out there. You know, there's different issues for everyone. Um, we have to, we have to think about that because 
no matter who goes out there, there's always going to be some kind of a, you know, an issue, you know, because we are not Hopi. We should not be talking about Hopi. I should not even be talking about Hopi, but I don't talk about Hopi in the sense that this is the thing, giving the perspective of Hopi. I share a very small piece and then say, you know what, beyond that, I think that the Hopi should explain it. It's not right for me to go any further than that. If I try to go further than that, then I am only giving some limited perspective that I have, and I do not do a service to them or to the sacredness of what's trying to be shared. Mm -hmm. So they would say there is no perspective. There just simply is the truth. And the, the issue is people come to Hopi and they say, this is the perspective, and they share that when, in fact, it's not correct because they don't know the whole truth. So perspective is extremely important for the individual, but we must recognize a, a very central part of what perspective is, and it is singular. It is singular so if we want to look at the perspective as the plural, the macro, we must no longer look at it only from our perspective, and we must take into consideration all other perspectives. Key point. It is. How do we get through when we listen to contactees, abductees, you know, experiencers, all of these people who have had had interaction with these beings from other dimensions and the physical crafts and so forth. What is the perspective? Yes. First of all, first and foremost, the perspective must be from the individual. And we must use caution to not take on um, the perspective of that one individual. For example, you know, certain people within this field have have said that all the beings are bad. And I'm like, wow, that's, wow. Why is it that the millions of us all over the earth are getting contact and being told to, to love and to open up and to get our gifts going and allow us to be able to see the future and, you know, how they're evil? Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that having your own voice and your own thought and your own understanding and having the ability to tap in to be, you know, have psychic gifts, as they would say, would be evil, you know, and that we're being manipulated because we're not. That's the lack of manipulation where they're trying to wake us up. Now, there may be other groups out there that are trying to shut us down. And I do, you know, feel that and see that also. But the perspective, we we have to use caution with that. Mm -hmm. It is the individual. And what we have to remember is that every single person who has any kind of experience, whether it is physical, astral, spiritual, meditational, anything with these beings, can only comprehend the value of that interaction from a limited, singular perspective. When we look at the grander picture of this particular experience that we are having, we absolutely must, first and foremost, accept that regardless of what it is that we are experiencing, whether it is in our minds, in our dreams, in our imaginations, is irrelevant. What is relevant is the effect that it has on us at the very end of all of this. And even Whitley Strieber will has admitted that in the beginning, his perspective was evil, dark beings that had no good intention whatsoever. And although I am not completely familiar with all of his work, because I don't follow, I don't follow other people's work, I don't to try and keep my mind clear. It's the only reason why I know that he changed that at some point and realized the depth of his own, quote, spiritual awakening 
to who he is and what his purpose may be in, in life, essentially. And his purpose not being his purpose to go out and write books and to share them, but his purpose as a living being, his purpose when he wakes up to enjoy and to intake the flowers and the trees and the plants and the animals to enjoy the, the senses of being loved and being in love. His, you know, and, and to bring all of that back and say, that's irrelevant. Well, it, it's only going to be irrelevant until you begin to experience something that's even similar because of your perspective. And then it's going, everything that we are experiencing will become relevant. Mm -hmm. So that word is a very powerful word. And I think that in our community, we need to have more conversation about that one word, perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the perspective? And how we support each other or attack each other as a result of that perspective. That is so true, Miriam. You know, um, I wrote a couple things down as you were saying that one of them was perspective as individual. And I think that a lot of people who are experiencers um, from a young age, that your perspective does change um, a little bit. And I found that to be true for myself. And I know it has been for you as well. Uh, maybe the perspective is different. Obviously, it is individual. Um, I very much uh, identified with you mentioned Whitley, his uh, evolution in his um, awareness of his reality for himself. But what was interesting was my reality was very similar to his as well almost um, age-wise in, in uh, certain um, age groups, for example, when he was very young, as a teenager, as a young adult, um, definitely has evolved into um, something quite beautiful and quite magical and very spiritual. And I, too, hate it when people say very negative things and that they get angry with me when I talk about how my experience has been wonderful. And, and, and on the one hand, you know, I do have that free will to speak about my experiences freely over the internet. Thank you very much. And I, I get, you know, I don't think it's fair for somebody to quantify the experience as malevolent because what do they know what I experienced and for them to call me a liar um, by saying what I do, because it is my experience. It's your experience. It's everyone's experiences that chooses to share it, period. It's not to be judged. It just is. Mm -hmm. End of story. But at the same time, it's very important that we do use our freedom of speech to share our truths just to make others aware of the possibilities that we might not have been open to before um, and not be so narrow-minded to think that this is it. Just what you see, what you can actually tangibly hold in your hand is not um, really all there is. As much as people would tend to embrace the Bible and religion as they were taught as children um, as truth, to be followed and, and honored. Um, it was something that was not tangible, but yet we tended to believe that. And, and many do still to this day as the way it is, but that's just perspective as well. Well, there's nothing to believe. Um, uh, you know, if we use the same argument, I would say, well, you got a Bible in front of you. It's a piece of paper. What that, you know, it's nothing. But what does that prove? Exactly. Well, there's God. Well, right. it says right here. Well, <laughs> It says it, it says that there's um, extraterrestrials uh, in ancient rock culture yeah. rocks that are fifty thousand years old. Right. So, which one would you go by? Right. Same thing. It's the perspective. It really and, is. And, and something that I wanted to just say um, about this perspective, and I use this example all the time. I I cannot and will not say this is all good. This is all bad. I'm going to say we need to be careful of what we know. And, or think that we know what our perspective is and where we're coming from. If someone has a massive heart attack and they realize that one of their valves is, you know, closed or closing, 
and they have to do open heart surgery, they take them into the hospital, they prep them, they sedate them, they open up their chest, they crack their ribs, they, you know, open them up. They put a little sheet in front of them so they can't see in case they do wake up, which is why that's there. So they don't panic and flip out in case they do happen to wake up for some ungodly known reason. And so that's what happens. Then they wake up the next day and they got stitches all down the front of them. And this is what, you know, this saved their life. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Now imagine a person from an ancient culture who's never had contact with quote unquote, you know, anything outside of the bush and they were taken in, they had a heart attack and had to have the same surgery. And let's just say for a moment that they woke up in the middle of that surgery and saw their open chest. What would their perspective be? So let's think about what the word perspective is about. Mm. Right. And then and then form your next question. Right. Exactly. Because I can guarantee one thing. There, there is another guarantee other than being born and dying. There is another guarantee when you're alive here. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And that guarantee is that your questions of life will never end. Mm. Your questions about what this, uh, what this phenomenon is about will never end. The questions about what and who God is will never end. We can be guaranteed of that. So what we need to do is go into our personal perspectives in a way that honors ourselves in our process and begins to honor or does continue to honor the life that surrounds us of all human, animal, plant, earth, elements, and the universe that exists. And 25 years it's been for me since my prime, you know, my primary, my biggest contact in 1988, 25 years this year, just last couple months ago, I had the anniversary date. And um, what I can say is that within days after that experience, I began to tell people that every single thing in human life in the future people would begin to realize that every single thing is interlinked to these beings. So if you're, if you're following the Bible and Jesus and God, I guarantee you that you are following life because the reality is, is that life is more than what we, what we think, what we perceive, what we understand, and what we see. Nothing in this life, and I know we're coming very close to the end of this, so I'd actually like to leave it with the thoughts of, not my thoughts, but questions to say. Right. We, whatever we think, see, understand, feel, perceive, is not as it appears to be. So continue asking questions of the people around you, of the research you're doing, of yourself. And through that process of being very quiet within yourself with what feels right for you today, because I can say it will not be the same tomorrow. We are in constant change and growth, but nothing in this life is as it appears to be. And God, I do believe in God as an ultimate God of everything that exists around us. I do believe that Jesus walked this earth. But I also know that God, to understand the concept, the concept alone of God, we must go within our hearts. And to have the true honoring of Jesus as an example Because so many, quote, religious people are here listening, trying to understand how this relates to them. Jesus was a divine being who grasped the concept that he was the son of God. The same as I am the daughter of God. And we must accept who we are as 
individuals, and we must accept who we are in relation to all that exists and God itself, to the life that is there. And the life is everything. And these beings, just like being on that table, having, having heart surgery, we must ask the questions, what were they doing? Did that, did that assist me in being human, more human? Or did it take away from me being human? And I have not met one single person who has had contact with any beings, good, bad, ugly, and different, who has not walked away from the experience. Being more open to life, being more open to be in service, to be m- more open to supporting and protecting human life, animal life, water life, plant life, and respecting each other more. So follow what God and what belief you want, even religion. And what I ask, I ask, is that everyone take from within themselves what it is that we need as individuals to love this person that you are. And by doing so, every question that you could ever imagine in the universe is available to you. There is nothing that you cannot learn. You do not even need to go to Hopi or to the religion or to even to the universe or even to these beings. You will have the answers to everything if you can do this by first loving yourself. It all is sitting there. So I am so thrilled to have had this time with you today, Suzanne. Is It's... Very casual conversation is how uh, I love to just chat with people. And I really, uh, I hope that we can do this again. The whole um, community really is making beautiful waves. We are not making aggressive waves. We are just making uh, ripples throughout the entire fabric of our world and it starts with one person at a time. And the number of people, um, we all affect the lives of others. And we can't ever even begin to imagine when we have kindness or we have support of some kind to another person, how much effect we have and vice versa. And, you know, I, I always say this after I say this because I'm not a perfect person either. We, we are not all perfect human beings, but just to try to be aware of it as much as possible and, and be good humans. To be good, to be good individual human beings is all that we're here to do. Thank you so much for joining us today, Miriam. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. If you would like to get in touch with Miriam or visit her website, you may do so at bluestarprophecy.com. Thank you again for joining us. Oh, she puts something to your pocket And there's a